Hi, I'm Matt Blackwell, and today we're going to show you a sample of Weijo data so that you can get the most out of connected vehicle data. I will attempt to seamlessly share my screen um, into the, the Databricks environment and actually start to give you an idea um, and give you a walkthrough of the environment and what you'll get access to. So hopefully that has come up now. Um, I'm getting the nod from, from Matt McCann, so I'm going to take that as a, as a yes. So first and foremost, what we always suggest any users of the, the Databricks or the, the sample preview environment, first port of call is to get familiar with the data schemas that we have. So we have data schemas that are available for both our vehicle movement and also our um, driver event data set. Now those schemas, um, if, we, if we have a look here, I'm not gonna go through absolutely all of the attributes, but those schemas help you to get familiar with the different attributes. So as a very good example, if you're looking to understand uh, speed in a particular area, then obviously you can use the speed attribute, but you may also want to um, fold in the, the heading of the vehicle to analyze bi-directional roads as well. So the data schemas are a very, very good place to start just to familiarize yourself um, with the way that the data is structured, with the attributes and the way to write those queries. Now, what we also have then are the driving events schema. Again, I'm not gonna go through every single attribute on here, but with the driver event data, because this is a very kind of situational contextual data set, we have things like um, acceleration type, some seatbelt status in there, and also um, you know, some things like hard braking and rapid acceleration. But what we also have, and I'll, I'll walk you through this shortly, um, from some of our more recent OEMs that we've onboarded, are very, very specific um, events within the vehicle. So as a, a good example, the leveraging of wiper status or autonomous emergency braking or ABS triggering. These are all the data attributes that you wouldn't typically get from a, um, a mobile collection device or a roadside unit. So in terms of the, the way that the actual data is structured within, within the Weijo sample preview environment, with the vehicle movements data, what we, the way we have actually set this up is we have pre-built notebooks for you so that you don't have to create queries from, from scratch. Now, for anybody on the, on the session today who is a, a data scientist or a data analyst, you'll hopefully be familiar with the way that these, these queries are structured. So we use an SQL here. We've had users that have been familiar with RStudio and also with Python as well. So first things first, we've started to produce some aggregate tables for you. So as I mentioned before, a count of the number of data points and a count of the number of journeys over that one week period. What we've then started to do is to break that down by day, and this is across the US. So at the moment, we are very much on the helicopter view of looking at the whole of the US with that aggregate output. What we've then started to do is to create some tables. So the graphs that you have here are all fully um, customizable within the environment. You can create your own graphs. The one caveat and restriction that we have is that no data can leave the environment. What we've then got started to do is to break down those data points by hour. So again, at this point, it's very, very high level. And I can't imagine there are many, if any people on the today's session who would want to know, um, you know how many data points by hour for the whole of the US, but we've pre-built these queries to allow you to get a lot more specific, whether that be at the state level, the county level, or even down to the waypoint level. Now, this is where we start to create a bit more, um, I suppose, customizable um, outputs. So we have taken essentially the average speed um, for three of our biggest states. So Texas, California, and New York. Um, and this is basically the average speed observed right across the state um, over a 24 hour period. Um, I am not casting any aspersions on the way that California drive versus Texans versus views New Yorkers, but this kind of gives you an idea in terms of the level of, of granularity that you can start to get down to. Now, the one question that we will always get asked um, and undoubtedly will probably be asked on, on the call today is actually how representative is, is the data? How, how reliable is it to be able to, to accurately model against? So what we've produced here are two kind of chloropleth maps, which detail the number of journeys and the number of data points per state. Now, if we just kind of hover over this, no surprise that we have very good representation in California, in Texas, in Florida, Michigan, New York. But what's really key with this is we have representation in every single state. 
And in every single state, we also have 95% representation across all roadways. But what's really key about this is in the main, our number of journeys and the number of data points follow population very, very closely. So in that sense, you can say the data set itself is without bias. Now, the fact that probably 98% of this data set is gleaned from privately owned vehicles, we are not seeing the typical A to B, A to B um, behavior that you see with a lot of fleet, fleet management services. Now, what you'll also have the ability to do is to you know, produce graphs such as this, which are heat maps. Now, again, this is just looking at the whole of the US in a, in a heat map and it's returning the first 100,000 queries. Now, what the good thing about leveraging um, the Databricks environment is, as we start to zoom into this, because you have your own dedicated cluster and dedicated environment, these maps will re-render re very, very quickly um, and you're not having to wait you know, minutes for, for anything, for any query to, to return. So you will, everybody will have access to our, our vehicle movement data set. And what you'll also then have access to is our driver event data set. So with our driver event data set, we have essentially clustered together a lot of these sensors into notebooks where the sensors kind of make, make sense to be grouped together. So if I have a look, um, firstly, for example, at this particular notebook, this looks at uh, acceleration, uh, hard braking, speed threshold, um, and I think there's also some seatbelt usage in there. So it's very much centered around a, a safety use case. Now, in exactly the same way as we have um, structured the, the notebooks in the vehicle movement data set, we've started to produce some really high level aggregates in terms of the number of journeys, the number of data points. And with our vehicle, uh, sorry, with our driver event data set, you can actually have access to two months worth of data. Um, to properly analyze and you know establish some controls. So if we pick out just a couple of these um, attributes which have been leveraged by a lot of research institutes, by a lot of civil engineering firms on the basis that we are actually getting hard braking and rapid acceleration data from vehicles. Now this hard braking data is very good, for example, for detecting back of cues, for understanding where there is a potential for an incident to occur in a particular area based on concentration. And what we started to then do is to actually break that down over this two month period. So little surprise that actually on Christmas day, there is very little in terms of hard braking and rapid acceleration. However, in the build up to that, if you drive anything like me over the festive period, it's very irritable. There's a lot of hard braking, there's a lot of rapid acceleration occurring. So again, at this point, we are visualizing the whole of the US. However, what you can start to do is to define latitudes and longitudes um, and start to actually get a lot more granular with those with that analysis. So as a very good example here, again, you'll have the ability to produce heat maps such as this. So this is essentially visualizing the hard acceleration data for the whole month of November across the US. And it's returning, as you can see here, the first 100,000 results. So what you would probably like most likely do is you would center down, you know, generate maybe a five mile um, polygon to understand what's the general kind of behavior in this particular area, or you may want to do it at the county level. Now, what's really important about our data set is that each and every data point is augmented. So when I say it's augmented, we augment it with the state code, with the region code, and with a geo hash as well. So if you wanted to produce some really high, you know, very high level aggregates for New York City, you could quickly do that just by using the, the state code abbreviation. We also leverage the autonomous emergency braking events as well. So this is getting to the level of kind of level one automation. But this is useful in areas where there is a lot of use, you know, there is a lot of concentration of autonomous emergency braking in a particular area could indicate, we've seen, you know, clients use it to indicate that there is glare at a particular point in the day where the driver isn't quick enough to react and the vehicle has to intervene. Or it could be that actually there is a, a particular issue with the infrastructure of the road. And again, the vehicle is having to brake for the driver. We also leverage anti-lock braking. So again, this is producing a you know a heat map of the number you know all of the the ABS triggering across the US, and then finally the speed threshold where that is where the vehicle goes over 80 miles an hour and subsequently goes under. Now I'll kind of finish the demo with just a, a bit of an overview around one of the notebooks, which is particularly um, poignant at the moment. Again, keeping with that safety use case, 
we start to actually look at uh, wiper uh, data within the within the vehicle. So if I just kind of move down to um, this area here, so I mentioned before that we actually leverage seatbelt status as well. So seatbelt latch and unlatch. Now, because that's event driven, what you can actually start to look at is, are there seatbelt latch and unlatch events happening on an interstate or on a freeway or an expressway where people are reaching 70 miles an hour and then you know buckling their seatbelts up? And that could be used to promote more seatbelt usage in a particular area. And we know that across a lot of the states, there is the mandate to be able to conduct these surveys every year. Now, with the wiper data, um, we actually leverage when the wiper is activated and deactivated, but also the intensity of the wipers as well, so from zero to four. Now, in addition to that, what we also capture at the point of activation is the external temperature. Now, why is that important? Well, if you think about where I'll, I'll use Texas as a very good example. So Texas is an area that has huge amounts of localized flooding. Um, of microclimates. I've had it myself where I've driven through there and you pass through a curtain of rain and on either side it's completely dry. Now what I like in this data to is essentially thousands of moving weather stations where we are seeing wiper activation but also wiper activation with minus two degrees outside where there is the propensity for aquaplaning. A very good example of where the wiper data has been used was a, a recent um, study conducted by one of our research partners where they saw a huge amount of wiper activation, which didn't correlate to known rainfall. Now, what they actually found in that instance was this roadway was parallel to a huge lake, and there was actually huge amounts of cast off coming from that lake and caught onto the roadway and causing people to have to put their, their windscreen wipers on. That's a very good example of where the data is being used as an additional layer, as an additional map layer, where typically most data sets and data collection methods fall short. So I think in terms of the, the demonstration itself, I think hopefully everybody's got to grips with the fact that there is a huge amount of value um, within these data sets and we want people to be able to properly analyze and use the environment to its fullest and also to, to, to give us feedback. I always encourage everybody that goes into the environment, please try and break it, use it to its maximum, use the two weeks to, you know, to, to really properly test the data out. So before I kind of finish things up, um, we wanted to kind of finish with, I suppose, a little bit of a, um, a couple of I suppose, case studies. Um, hopefully I've switched back my screen to, to the presentation mode. I'm getting the nod from Matt, okay. Um, around testimonials um, that, we've, that we've had from, from a couple of customers that have used the environment. So this is a good example of a company who uh, GIS and location data very much centered around the, the sort of retail um, scenario. So, you know, a couple of example use cases here were things like point of interest trends, things like retail site location, where do I put my new location and origin to destination in terms of, you know, what's the catchment area of that particular store. Now, the feedback that we had was, you know, the, very, the UI and the UX are actually very easy to work with. Now, hopefully you'll have seen that in the demonstration there that, yes, it doesn't have the typical sliders and buttons, but that's not what sample preview is, is designed for. It's designed for the data analyst and the data scientist. And I think what was key on here as well is when we start to look at the trips, so we define a trip as an ignition on and an ignition off and everything in between. We are actually capturing a lot of the short trips they aren't typically captured by travel demand surveys. So when travel demand surveys are done and people drive less than a mile, they're not usually captured as part of that. However, we were able to capture those short trips, but also the long trips um, that, again, most data collection methods just don't have the capability to do. And then the second is an area that we see a lot of traction and a lot of growth in is around the sort of transport and infrastructure. Um, and this very much in keeps with your civil engineering firms, um, your traffic modelers. So the types of use cases we're looking at here is things like uh, dynamic signal timing, traffic management, ITS models. So the kind of feedback that we had here was, you know, actually being able to conduct speed and origin destination using big data was a game changer because of the fact that we are capturing the speed every three seconds, you're essentially able to, to, to model out and map an entire signalized corridor where that wasn't possible before. 
Now, also in addition to this, um, you know, the, the final testimony that I'll, I'll, I'll cite here is, you know, the, the ability to run queries at both the corridor and the intersection levels it gives us that micro and macro view. So as I said before, by actually leveraging the latitude and the longitude within the sample preview environment, you can conduct queries on a very, very small segment of road. So there could be an area where there's particularly bottlenecks, you know, pr prone to a lot of congestion. You're able to look at, okay, what's happening in that area throughout over a 24 hour period, over a one week period, over a one month period, you're able to do that.